morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Uh, today I'm bringing you a special Christmas episode, um, which I'd originally intended to be a Christmas Day release, but a few facts combined to make that impossible, mainly just running out of time with um, Christmas and family and whatnot. Um, so I'm releasing this for you today. Uh, this episode talks about the fantastic documentary Somewhere You Feel Free, The Making of Wildflowers, um, and I thought that I'd switch things up a little with this episode and go off script, more or less. So what I did was I sat down, watched the documentary again, and jotted down some notes. And what I'm going to do is talk through those notes. I'll, I'll sort of, I've got my notepad here. I'll look through those notes um, and, and talk about what I wrote down and anything else that comes to mind. And hopefully you enjoy that change of gears, just for this one off. Um, I'm also recording the video for this one. So if you want to watch me talk about this, it will be on YouTube. Um, and the last thing is I'm not going to edit this. I'm just going to leave it as is because usually I edit out all my clicks and that and, and redos. If I have to redo anything, I'll go through it and you'll see it what's and all. Um, before we start though, uh, massive props to Mary Wharton who directed the film and I'd really love to get her on the podcast at some point to talk about the, the process of putting this together um, as I'm sure there's just a ton of sort of uh, things that we didn't see in the final thing um, and, and sort of try to pick her brain about how she chose which footage to use and how to sort of knit that together into something that's so cohesive and so emotional and, and connective with Tom Petty fans and with the music um, and bringing that album together to life in a, in a unique way. So anyway, let's get into the doc and my notes. Before we start though, I should say, look at my face. If you see, uh, I went for an 11km run today and you can see here I've got a little bit of frost in it because it's minus 26 here in Saskatoon. And uh, oh, I just <laughs> leaned away from the mic there. Um, it's minus 26 in Saskatoon um, and it's probably definitely time for me to go full face mask rather than trying to run with none. So, uh, all right, so let's get into it. So I'm just going to read the, one of the title uh, cards from earlier in the documentary. In early 2020, a collection of 16 mil film was discovered in the Tom Petty archive. Wouldn't we all like to get into the Tom Petty archive? Uh, shot between 1993 and 1995 by Petty's longtime filmographer, Martin Atkins, uh, while Petty was recording the Wildflowers album and on the tour that followed, most of this um, has never been seen before. So, one of the first things one of my first notes here is that i love the goofy shot of him messing around with the with the trumpet and throughout the documentary you definitely get a sense that tom Petty had a fantastic sense of humor um and uh there was a lot of levity and a lot of um spirit within those sessions and of course the music being recorded properly and being you know the the, the sort of care being given to the songs would have been first and foremost that would have been the main target of, of, of all these sessions but there was definitely, like I said, that lightness of touch and that sort of that, that, um, that well, that levity um, in everything that he did. So I really enjoyed seeing that come through. And I also loved the way that Mary Wharton introduces Rick Rubin's involvement. Um, so what I wrote down was, he's, you know, he's produced some mon monumental albums. But when you sit and listen to him talking about Wildflowers, it clearly stands out for him. Uh, and he talks about Full Moon Fever being his intro into Tom Petty and not really being a big Tom Petty fan before then because, you know, he's a, he's, he's a hardcore punk guy and a rap guy and everything else. So Tom Petty, you could see, would, would have not necessarily been on his radar. But Full Moon Fever, he said, you know, he listened to it just thousands of times driving around L.A. Um, and listened to it in his car. And I think that, you know, for someone like Rick Rubin to really latch onto Tom Petty shows you that he really is an artist for all seasons, for all generations, and for all sort of um, musical tastes. Um, and one of the things that he he says in the in the documentary that I resonate with completely was uh, how can there be this many good songs from one person? Now I remember when I got into Tom Petty and I started digging back, you know, and we all know the hits, we all know the greatest hits, we all know Full Moon Fever, which a lot of the greatest hits are off. But then when you dig back into, or I, as I did, you dig back into the catalog and it's just album after album after album after album of just song after song after song of just top notch quality. And I, I remember that really blew my mind too. And it was one of the things that sort of gave me that impetus to really start listening to Tom Petty, you know, uh, much more fervently. Um, there's a clip where Tom... Oh, yeah, there's a bit where this... I think it's maybe in the in sound check or rehearsal for one of the shows where Tom's talking to Howie and Steve Ferroni. And this, again, goes back to sort of Tom's sense of humor, obviously. And he obviously he says something funny and Howie just cracks up and you can see him so he's almost doubled over and, and you see that 
great big Steve Ferroni smile. Um, and I think that, again, that sort of, it, it was filmed surreptitiously and, you know, the, the, I don't think they knew they were on camera. Obviously, they knew the cameras were there, but they weren't aware of being filmed. So I love that sort of the natural spirit of what it must have been like hanging out backstage and being a part of Tom's band. Um, so I really enjoyed that bit too. I've got a lot of notes here, but I might have to cut some of them out. Um, we find out too that it's good to be king. Um, it was the first demo that Rick Rubin listened to. Um, and man, what a first track to work from. I can only imagine that on hearing that song, Rick Rubin must have thought, okay, well, this is going to be a good project. Obviously, this guy's got still got a few things up his sleeve. Um, and again, you hear, so then you see at that point that we bring in Michael Kamen for all the orchestral arrangements. And again, just if you think, just think about the at that point in Tom's career, the people that he could leverage and call on to sort of bring something in, something special in. And when you bring in Rick Rubin, you bring in Michael Kamen, you know, we find out later that he brings in Steve Ferroni. You get all these sort of external influences that really elevate this 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 idea and this project to a place that the Heartbreakers alone, and maybe with, even with Jimmy Iovine, probably wouldn't have hit the same heights, I don't think. Um, and Benmont says, you know, uh, or sorry, yeah, Benmont, and it's shortly after that, Benmont says that, you know, you almost take for granted that Tom is going to come in with something great, with a great song. Um, and so I think it's that there is that sense that, and he says later on that, you, you know, you kind of, that becomes a little bit, you, you can become complacent when you have a, such a gifted songwriter in your band. But I think that the one of the things that does set the Heartbreakers apart, even though this is a solo record, is that I don't think they ever really did that. I think that they they knew that Tom would deliver the goods and then they, they had to as well. They had to deliver their goods. They had to sort of match or surpass what he was bringing and bring something unique and important and special to the song themselves. Um, so when he set that bar really, really high, I think other people's talented musicians like Ben Montench and Mike Campbell, Steve Ferroni, Scott Thurston, they just feed off that, right? So, And the only thing I, I was wondering too, I made a note here, but I wonder, because the cameras obviously were prevalent during that whole recording process. And I, I do sometimes wonder whether that ever stifled the creative process or whether they actually maybe sometimes said like can you just turn the cameras off for a little while um because it would be quite annoying to have a camera in your face the whole time and you really get that sense that even when they're just practicing or demoing there's obviously what well, someone's videoing and then you get the guy with the camera taking stills it might get a little bit much sometimes so i kind of wonder what the dynamic of that was which would be another good question to ask um maybe mike campbell or ben montent someday um one of again one of my favorite moments of the documentary was when they're when Mike, sorry, when Tom and Ben Mont are in a one of the sound booths, I think it's probably this piano sound booth, and they're just playing through Wildflowers. And Ben Mont's laying there in this, you know, slick, and you can you can hear the beginnings of that um, that piano part that he, that comes in sort of later in the song, where he's playing a little bit more of an arpeggio and he's playing a little bit more freely, and it's not just keeping the chords together. Um, with Tom sitting there playing the acoustic guitar and singing the vocals over top, it's just I, I love those moments of watching a band play together even just two play two two people or three people in a band playing together and figuring out a song and just playing through it I, I always enjoy watching those types of things okay my next note um about wildflowers tom and i find this really interesting as a hobbyist amateur songwriter said that that song came to him basically fully formed um lyrics music just one go he sat down in his home studio hit record and just played the whole thing through. We had the vocals, the lyrics, everything, the melody, the whole thing. And sort of sat and listened to, well, what do I change? What do we add? What do we take out? And decided that actually it's probably pretty good as it is. I think it's a really good insight into um, the workings of a, a musical genius mind that sometimes those things happen. I think sometimes people imagine that's always the way it is. You know, that songs just fall out of artists. Well, no, songs are a lot of work. A lot of the time, and you, you know, they talk about that later in the in the documentary about sometimes you've got to go through the work of writing a song, but sometimes those songs really do just fall out of the sky. And Wildflowers was one of them, and I think it is one of the most natural sounding songs Tom ever recorded. Um, another wonderful thing I enjoy about the documentary is the way that the the talking head pieces that focused solely on Rick Rubin when he's talking about his involvement in the process or he's talking about the project as a whole, they're shot very grainy. Um, and that's just a nice aesthetic artistic touch that Mary Wharton has 
you know, a creative decision that she's made to present that footage in that way, um, which just gives it again. It's got it's almost got that art house kind of kind of feel to it. Um, another note I've made about Harry Green, uh, a song that is on obviously all the rest, but didn't make it onto the the final album. But that guitar lick, um, I think that as that song wasn't released at the time. Tom still knew there was definitely something there, and obviously it's, it's the same guitar lick from Angel Dream, more or less, right? So, so I love that idea again that when you write a song, and even sometimes if you record a song, but it doesn't quite make the cut, you you keep those elements. You think, well, I might be able to recycle that. I might be able to bring that into something else, or just change it very slightly, or adapt it and make it work for a different song idea or a different lyric or something. So I think that was super cool to watch that. Oh, and another thing on Harry Harry uh, Harry Green. I often wonder whether the protagonist in that song is uh, gay. Because if you think about the lyrics and where they go, I I can see that being a very, sort of very socially conscious lyric. And maybe that's a reason that it kind of didn't end up making the cut in the end because it didn't quite fit thematically. But to me, that's always been a a song about an outsider, but he's an outsider for a reason. He's not just an outsider. There's a very specific reason that keeps Harry Green apart from everyone else. And Tom, you know, sort of says in the lyrics that he was cool with Harry Green, which implies that some people weren't. So I wonder if that was, if that's the reason. Uh, of course, one of the other things that many people have commented uh, through Tom Petty Nation and on the online forums and whatnot, and in the YouTube comments is that this is another sh- time we get to spend a little bit of time with not only Tom, but with Howie Epstein, who obviously left us far too early. And so he's such a gentle, wonderful spirit that anytime you see Howie in that footage, it kind of it gets you a little bit. It's a little bit bittersweet, you know, where you remember the remember how good he was and how phenomenally he sounded with Tom. And Tom even talks about, I think there's, I've made another note somewhere else. I'll maybe I'll talk about that. But he says that, you know, if there's anyone I want to sing with, it's Howie. He's the guy who I, you know, vocally just works well with, um, and would rather sing with than anyone else. Um, so you know, one of the things I think the documentary exposes as well is that or does a good job of sort of clarifying is why Wildflowers is a solo record rather than a Heartbreakers record. Because apart from Stan, obviously, and we'll get into that a little bit maybe, but uh, this is this, I mean, all the Heartbreakers played on the record. Uh, But thematically and where the songs came from, Tom wasn't writing these for the Heartbreakers. He was writing them, they were coming out of him as an individual. And they have, you know, a lot of the songs have such a personal feel that, I think it's right that it's considered as a solo album rather than a, you know, a Heartbreakers record. And I think that the, at the the narrative through the documentary really sort of clarifies that and shows you that everyone else is cool with that. Ben Mont's okay with that, and Ben Mont's you know said later that it was some somewhat mystifying that it was a, a, a solo album or a Heartbreakers record. But I think in retrospect, when you look at that and you say, okay, well these songs were about a very were written from a very specific point in Tom's life um, that it just that it had to be a solo record really and it gave him that freedom to bring in Michael Kamen to you know audition different drummers different bass players originally before they said well no it's, it's got to be Howie right um, so I, I, I totally get why it is a solo record rather than a Heart Records record um, there's a bit on To Find a Friend um, when the footage there where they're all sitting around in, in the round and and it's great watching Tom walk the band through the chord changes because that's a really, again, a, a fairly non-standard chord progression in To Find a Friend. And you can see how he's fumbling it a little bit because he's not quite sure where the, where the changes are. Um, and so, I, again, anyone who's ever played in a band or written a song or been in the studio, you know that that's a process that, yeah, you got to go, oh, no, it, it doesn't go from E to A, it goes from E to F sharp. So there's, you know, there's different little bits and pieces at play there that show those band dynamics and they show a band. That's how bands work. They play with each other. Well, that sounds wrong, doesn't it? They play against each other um, and figure things out as they go. Um, and Adria says um, in the documentary that I think either just before or during the making of Wildflowers, Tom had started going to uh, therapy, which again, I think maybe maybe that helped him unlock a way to express himself emotionally in a different way or a more direct way because again i think the the songs that are that are very clearly personal on this record are they're expressed a lot more clearly than on previous records so that that was an interesting sort of um tidbit to take away from it 
Um, so they talk about two. I mean, obviously the the, the situation with Stan um, and Stan had to leave, but then they did the two songs for Greatest Hits. Um, and one thing I thought that was kind of cool was that Tom says that those were the past greatest hits. They just, oh, sorry, no, Rick Rubin talks about it. Um, he says that Tom viewed those songs as being, well, that's the greatest hits of the past and Wildflowers is the future. And I think that any Tom Petty fan recognizes that. I mean, I, I always think of Tom's work in three periods. There's the early period, the middle period, and then the late period. But Wildflowers definitely within that middle period to me is, is a real sort of an actual turning point. Like it, it just, it, he started writing songs at just a different level, just incredibly um, artistically dense um, and lyrically more, I would say, more clinical in word selection and those types of things. And I think uh, Mike Campbell says in the documentary that Tom was a student of words. He loved the English language, very well read. Um, he used to like watch, watching old movies. And so I think having that sense of um, lyrical dexterity, which he always had, and you know, were definitely prevalent on those early albums, just really ramped up from Wildflowers on. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed sort of reading about that. Um, another part that I like in the documentary is when Steve Ferrone comes in. And you just, I mean, obviously Steve Ferroni with that big smile, that, that huge smile, that huge charisma, that huge presence, that huge positivity, um, which everyone else commented on. And he said, you know, as he arrived, Kenny Aronoff's, Aronoff's kit's coming out, um, which wasn't hugely unusual. But when he saw that it was Tom Petty and Mike Campbell in the control room, he was like, ah, okay. Which can you imagine going into that environment? Even as great a drummer as Steve is, going into an environment where you're expected to pick up and record on some of these songs that obviously mean hell of a lot to the the songwriter could be intimidating um i don't think it probably was for steve because he's such a consummate professional and such an amazing session drummer and a, and a brilliant musician all around so um one of the other things we find out on the album is that they didn't play to a click so there's no metronome in any of those songs it was a natural um sort of what they call it earthy and natural uh, no clicks no drum machines and so uh on a few of the songs they say that you know steve would just play hi-hat and they would play along to that. And of course, Steve Ferroni's got great timing, great rhythm. Um, but they'll play along to that. And so you do get that human feel to it, um, which, you know, in juxtaposition to the stuff that Jeff Lynn did, which is very produced and it's very, and they're great records um, and great, great pop songs, but it's a little bit different. You just get a different feel from that. Um, and again, through the documentary, you do get the sense that the process of making the album was it as important to everyone, especially to Tom? It was as important as the output. Um, and, he, you know, Rick Rubin says, I enjoyed our time in the studio every single day. Um, which, again, you, you probably should, right? I mean, if you're going to create something, everyone should be relaxed. Everyone should be having a good time, hopefully. And Mike talks about, you know, uh, trying to make every song the best song that they ever wrote, which is such a cool way to approach making music. You're not going to, let's just get 10 tracks down. And you know that some of them are going to be killer. You know that some are maybe going to be a little bit of filler. Tom Petty never approached things that way. Like, let's do, make this song, the song that we're recording today, or the song that we're working on right now, make it the best damn song that we've ever recorded. And again, that's, it, it's hard to argue with the the outcome of the sessions because Wildflowers is, it's probably, it is my favorite album of all time, I would say. So, um, And Ben Mont says, you know, um, we're trying to do what we always did to do it really well. And he says that if you black out while well, I think I can't remember which track he was talking about. Um, crawling back to you, I think. He says if you black out while playing the track, you know, and you're stone cold sober, that's a very good sign because it means you're inside the music. I think any again, any musician will, will know that if you play a song and you don't remember playing the song, that's a pretty good thing, as long as you did it well. Um, speaking of crawling back to you, Steve Ferroni uh, mentions that he has a tattoo about that line, most things I worry about never happen anyway. And it's it's a line that I think all Tom Petty songs really, um, really love. Um, and I think that, that whole, the whole lyric of that song is just otherworldly. It's, it's such a superb piece of craftsmanship and, and artistry. Um, where are we at now? I was talking about the, yeah, I made a note here that the, as a music nerd, one of the things I love most about the documentary is the the band jams. Again, just when you see two or three or four or five 
people sitting in a room playing music together and looking at each other and watching for cues and, and waiting for things to happen and or someone even just saying well this is the key change or whatever it is i really enjoy those because it just shows that songs again as i said earlier songs don't fall out of the sky they're created they're crafted and they have to be honed and polished and made to work by a group of very very talented musicians you know and we all know that Wildflowers was originally intended to be a double album, essentially, and we got that eventually with Wildflowers and all the rest. Um, but it comes out that Tom always had final say on sequencing, um, but kind of got scared off a little bit by the record company saying, no, oh, we don't think a double album can sell. Well, Tom, uh, Wildflowers and all the rest became the quickest selling album that they ever released showing the, I think it went what, triple platinum within eight weeks or something like that, I think it said. Um, which shows the record company that no, there's an appetite for those types of works um, and that maybe you missed a beat there. Um, I think one of the, the sort of the, one of the overall notes that was left quite late in the documentary that sort of sums things up was when Tom says that he wasn't in any hurry to finish it. You know, and I definitely get that sense that, again, that the process of making the album was just so enjoyable. And obviously an escape for him because he was going through a really tough time in his life, um, especially with his marriage breaking down and, and whatnot. And, and Adria says that she knew when she listened that this was sort of the divorce album. She knew that she knew that her mum and dad were getting divorced, which is really sad. But you know, I I, I think that there's a there's a maybe a, a slightly morbid um, beauty to that as well. That um, Tom was able to finally draw a, a line under a part of his life that wasn't fulfilling and was, was causing him hurt. Um, and so to be able to do, get out of that and get into the studio, create something so beautiful, even in the midst of um, sort of the, one of the darkest periods in his life, kind of reminds me a little bit about of, of Beethoven, you know, and some of the stuff that he wrote in his later years, despite the fact that he was almost completely deaf, um, completely broke, in immense pain through different um, uh, physical ailments. But to still be able to create things of beauty, that shows, I think, that, you know, artists of that caliber, and, are, you know, I'd put Tom Petty at that same level, um, are able of, able of uh, sorry, capable of creating so. Um, and it's, yeah, the, oh, I can't remember who said this. Rick Rubin, I think, it's, it, it, it's the, 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 the album has a diary-like aspect um, in that it reflects a point in an artist's life um, that you can't ever get back again, right? So you can write great songs, you can write great albums, but if you can really sort of channel who you are at that point, then it just elevates it to something completely different. Um, my last notes would be the, I think it was, yeah. So I, I've made an argument before on social media that I think Wildflowers might be the last truly great album that's been made by a, you know, a, what's a mainstream but a, like a, a major recording artist i can't really think of anything quickly that surpasses it and not too many things that match it um since it was released um because it's a perfect selection of 15 songs and of course obviously the all the rest are also some fantastic so harry green and california and um 13 days and all the you know all these tracks on 13 days ended up in on she's the one but um I just think that it's it's in every way, in every way, a perfect album. Cinematically, it's also the documentary is also superb. Um, in that, at first you're watching a film, you know, for the first sort of five minutes or so, you're set up and you know you're watching a film and you're watching something from the outside. But the way that it's put together, you're gradually you're sucked into the room more and more and more and more, where you really feel just like a fly on the wall watching this thing come to life. Um, the aesthetic is managed beautifully. Um, so you get this art piece, um, but you also get Tom back again for 90 minutes and we get Howie back a little bit, you know. And, and so there's that sort of emotional, uh, sentimental connection to the documentary that makes it just, again, just a, spe a special, special experience. Um, and the last thing that I really sort of, the last note I've made here is that it, it is a memoir. It's not a, it's not a musical biography. We had that already with Running Down a Dream, where we chronicle Tom's early life and his progression through the heartbreakers and, and blah, 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 blah. 
really, this is about a very singular point in his life and about one album that meant an incredible amount to Tom and means an incredible amount to most of Tom's fans. And I think that most um, petty heads would say that this is in the top two or three albums he ever recorded. I can't imagine anyone saying that it isn't. Um, so, yeah. So those are my thoughts on uh, Somewhere You Feel Free. Like I said, I wanted to try and do this a little bit more off the cuff and a little bit more spontaneous just to see how it feels and see how it goes. Um, let me know in the sort of in the comment sections and, and what have you um, if you thought it was okay or if it's absolute crap. Um, I might do it again. I might not. We'll see how it goes. Um, but don't forget to follow me. I'm going to do my little script thing here now. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, uh, at the Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project and of course you can find me on YouTube uh, so follow like subscribe all those boring things um, because they really do help they help me sort of get the word out there and they help me build my listenership and, and, and make things more um, wide-ranging as we talk about Tom's music um, until we meet again next week keep listening to Tom's music and keep talking about Tom's music try to be kind try to say I love you to someone at least once a day um, stay safe and healthy and I'll be back with you next week to talk about the first track from side two of the second album, I Need to Know. Not a bad song, eh? Okay, bye-bye.